Okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our, our, our webinar on using Secret Agent Society flexibly with our, our professional best practice approach. Uh, my name is Kathleen Davey. I'm the CEO of uh, Social Science Translated and a, a clinical psychologist. Been involved with this program uh, for a very long time now. Uh, and I'm joined with a number of SST team members who you may or may not have spoken to already. But one who um, who might be helping me with this presentation is Melissa Legree. I know some people online today have met Melissa. Melissa's based in Toronto, Canada. Melissa, would you like to um, just unmute and say hello? Yes, sure. Welcome, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today or tonight, wherever you are. <laughs> That's a really good point. We do have people from uh, multiple countries uh, today. We also have people online who are very seasoned SAS facilitators uh, who have been you know, using the program for over a decade. We also have people who are brand new, who are only just starting to learn about SAS. So my goal today is to talk about how you can use the resources flexibly and in different ways. Um, in a way that's uh, introducing new people to it, but also taking existing people to, to, a, to another place, so to speak. So it'll be a bit of everything for everyone, I hope. We'll do my best. Okay, so our uh, business, Social Science Translated, we're all about trying to have everybody able to play to their strengths and valuing diverse life skills for all of us to be able to manage the diverse range of situations and other people that we have to interact with in life. So that's what we're all about. Uh, and today we're talking about one of the, the ways in which we deliver that to the world, which is through Secret Agent Society. I've popped a little QR code there. Uh, there's a few through this presentation for different resources or access points. This one is for our Contact Us form. Just again, reminding people we're recording it. Um, if you have a question um, that you'd like to ask outside the session, jump into that Contact Us form, ask your question, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Excellent. So I think everyone online here is in the business of preparing children for life social emotional challenges. That's what we all, um, you know, what we're trying to do while we're here, why would we be even thinking about secret agent society? So we're going to look at how we do that through a professional best practice lens. It it's, can be quite confusing and sometimes scary in the current world um, in terms of what actually is in everyone's best interests, when do I use my clinical skills? When do I do what the book says? You know, how, how do I manage all this? And, and then I've also got uh, my own values and my clients' values and everyone's got different needs. Sometimes it can be quite confusing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now in, uh, in our view, professional best practice is when we combine our clinical skills or our educational skills, you know, our, our professional skills with the best available evidence that's out there Sometimes there's lots, sometimes there's not, depending on what we're doing. We also combine this with the child or the family's goals and values. So what's important to them and what, what's their background, what's their uh, philosophies and values. And then we need to work flexibly and creatively to work within our professional boundaries and use what we've got to meet the, the, uh, the child and the family's means, sorry, needs within your service means. I'm very aware also that some of the people online today, the ones I know anyway, are from very different service types. Some of you are from schools, some of you are from private allied health clinics, some of you are medical professionals, some of you are speeches. Um, there's lots of different uh, services that have different funding models and different limits to how you can actually work with families. So we're going to explore flexibility so you can apply it to your service. Underlying where we're going is that all brains and services are unique. We have a range of tools that you'll be able to use for different ranges of children and family uh, families when you're doing individual work or group work, structured and unstructured programming, um, whether you work in a clinical or education setting, whether you deliver in-person or the ever more popular telehealth and remote services, and professional versus home use. There's a lot of things that uh, SAS can be applied for in all these different settings. Um, so we're going to explore a lot of those. Who we are, if those of you who don't know, just to, to give a bit of background to, and why we're even here talking to you about this today. So Social Science Translated is a wholly owned subsidiary of the not-for-profit Autism CRC, which is based in Australia. But we deliver the Secret Agent Society program globally. Uh, we're all about delivering evidence-based, practical solutions that engage professionals, children and families to diversify their life skills. Our flagship program is Secret Agent Society, and that's what we're all focused on today in this, this webinar. 
We've been working with that for over 14 years, which is reflected in this timeline. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, then there's more information on the, on the website on this. But I did want to highlight, given what we're talking about today, the number of uh, evolutions Secret Agent Society has gone through over the time, because it was originally a PhD project. Uh, so, you know, uh, early stage development of something done in a university randomised control trial setting, uh, and then it was transformed into something that people could actually use out in the community and, and could be distributed. And then it's had like three commercial editions out there. Uh, we've gone from having a, a DVD disc to having a full uh, online web app, all sorts of different changes over the time, including, um, I thought I'd just point out things like back in 2017 was when we started taking out gendered references. It was a sort of change in the way we all communicated uh, and we knew that had to go. More recently, uh, since we've launched the digital edition platform, we've even done an update since then uh, where we've implemented new changes aligned with best practice and community needs, um, specifically around neurodivergent affirming approaches that some of you online today would be using. And we'll talk more about that as well. So we've been doing our best within our means to try and keep up and evolve and not have a stagnant program. But, you know, there's always, that means every day there's always something we wish we could do and improve. Can't always do it. <laughs> There's lots and lots of different resources as a result of this, uh, this journey. Okay, now today we're gonna to talk about uh, a few different areas of training and resources that we have that you can use flexibly in different ways, which you may not have realized that you could do. I know online today we have trained facilitators in the SAS Small Group Program, the top one on my slide here. The bees knees evidence-based fully structured uh, program that has uh, wraparound supports for the child all built in. That can be used incredibly flexibly, and we're going to explore that a little bit uh, today. The SAS Computer Game Pack, that's the resource that anyone can just jump online and buy it and use it however they like. I'll explore that a little bit more too. Uh, and we have the SAS Intelligence Pack, which I'll weave in. I'll tell you what it is, and I'll weave into how you can use it flexibly. Now, thank you so much for everyone who registered and asked a question. There have been uh, so many people registering and so many different questions. I've popped a, a comprehensive list of questions on the slide here. Uh, some of the ones that we are um, definitely diving into, the top one there about using SAS individually, that is becoming a, an increasing question. Uh, so I've definitely got some uh, demystifying answers for you there. Um, using SAS to only work on emotion regulation, uh, using resources when the parents aren't in, uh, wanting to be involved or when the parents can't be involved, uh, all sorts of different questions, even about how to change the order of the content that you're presenting to um, children across your SAS group, which I will cover how you do that as well. Lots and lots of different things. Now, to, uh, to dive into these, because we've got people uh, online who are new to SAS completely, I'm going to give an orientation to what the small group program is, what the computer game pack is and what the intelligence pack is. So that then we can go, how do you use these in these different ways? All right, SAS Small Group Program. It is really the foundation. It's the main program uh, that had the original RCT through the, the um, PhD at University of Queensland. It's a group program. However, you can have a group of one, little, uh, little uh, precursor to uh, later information. It's a group program that professionals lead with groups of children and involves their adult support network as well, such as parents and teachers. It's generally eight to 12 year olds. Um, and there's a digital platform that connects everyone together and enables fast information sharing and access and real time progress tracking with the children you're working with. It's uh, predominantly, it can be summarised as covering four areas, emotion recognition, emotion regulation, problem solving, and a series of social skills for different things like friendship and teamwork. However, underneath that, you know, summary, yeah, you've got a four in one, you've actually got like a, a 24 in one. <laughs> there are so many skills in each of those areas, um, which I've got uh, showing there on the slides which will be relevant to what we're talking about when we go, okay, what if I've got a child where all I want to work on is bullying or problem solving, or they have really significant anxiety uh, challenges and I want to work on their anxiety regulation. How can I use these resources to help that child? We will, we will cover that. The SAS Small Group Program has a, a structure uh, that makes everything all easy and pre-prepared for you to engage parents 
children and teachers, or an alternative adult that, that may not be those particular categories. This structure represents the, the flow or the timeline of the program. It starts with your intake and pre-assessment. You set up the parents and teachers with parent and teacher information sessions. Then you start running your child modules through a, a usually a nine or an 18 module um, experience, depending on whether you're doing long sessions or short sessions. And then there's six month follow-up periods. There's built-in assessment at pre, post, follow-up and follow-up too. So there's this whole process, there's all resources that support you to do this, including these teacher tip sheets that are going on here. And in between each mission, there's computer game play, uh, sorry, missions, the group meetings, there's computer game play, there's missions, and there's something called a skill tracker going on as well. It's very comprehensive and it's got all the resources and structure in place for you to, to do a really effective job. Um, this slide kind of visualizes what I was saying about those components, parent components, child components, teacher components. There's four levels of computer game play, and there's all sorts of other things going on in the middle there, including those teacher tip sheets. Many, many things. Now, I mentioned the teacher tip sheets and the involvement of other adults. One of the things that some people new to SAS won't realize is that in those teacher tip sheets, it goes beyond uh, what's the child learning this week and how do I integrate that into my classroom to help them to use their skills and, and learn or feel safe or whatever's happening for them. It also has uh, different general classroom tips and tricks. For example, in one of the tip sheets, there's a focus on peer acceptance. How do we increase the likelihood that the kids we're working with are going to have a positive response from their peers? How do we make a more friendly classroom or diverse, um, not diverse, um, inclusive classroom where everyone's accepting all the differences and, and celebrating and learning how to, to interact together when we're all, we're all different? Um, so yeah, there's lots of different things in the small group group program. Because it has the digital platform behind it now, you can deliver it with in-person or in-class services. You can also deliver it entirely via telehealth or distance learning, um, where you, you never physically see the parents or the kids at all, and you can deliver the whole, whole thing via telehealth service, um, which I've got a little clip here that shows you a session might look like when you're integrating it with the video conferencing um, platform. You can also do it in a hybrid way where you mix your in-person and your telehealth, or you can have someone be away one week and still log in um, from their, their caravan trip around Australia. They're going off one that's popular at the moment, take three months off and take the kids around the country. You could still log into your SAS live group meeting um, from the caravan on dad's laptop while the rest of the group are in person at the clinic. So lots of different options. The assessment I mentioned, there's actually all pre-built in automated assessment uh, in the program. However, you can also choose not to use that assessment or to use different assessment tools or supplement with additional ones and still use the platform to track the scores and graph the results and to export it all in one, one easy to report um, uh, place at the end of the program. Okay, so I think the key here with SS Small Group Program is that it is very comprehensive. Almost everything you need is already pre-prepared and it's got a nice set structure that, that involves all the people around the child to get the best results. And the whole purpose of it is to individualise it to each child's needs, which we'll talk in more detail. Next uh, suite of resources is the SAS Computer Game Pack. Now, this is essentially access to the four, the core four levels of gameplay, and then there's other key tools and visual supports. This tool um, pack can be used as a structured program where you actually sort of follow a sequence of hierarchical skill building, or you can use it as a semi-structured process or completely unstructured, where all you do is jump in and play one particular game with one particular child because you want to use it as an example during a discussion about um, anxiety. I used anxiety as an example before. You can use it for individual work. You can have it where every child has their own login and their progress is being tracked and they can do it at home and at your clinic and at school and wherever. Um, or you can do it um, uh, in group methods as well. And parents can buy them and use it at home. We recommend a professional supports that process and supports how to actually um, uh, extend it for the child at home. But parents can purchase it and use it themselves at home. Now, the computer game pack in when you're playing in digital headquarters, four levels of gameplay, 
Level one focuses on clues that signal emotions from face, voice and body clues. So recognizing what's happening for other people. Level two is recognizing what's happening inside yourself, what's happening in your body and your energy, uh, learning to understand your emotions um, and your sensory responses um, and how to look at that in a degrees, like how to notice if it's say anxiety again is rising or falling, starting to recognize that. And then it starts to bring in examples in level three of what happens when you do and don't use your relaxation gadgets to calm yourself down in certain situations. Uh, level four has a self-reflection quiz and graduation ceremony. So that's kind of, if you were using it in a hierarchical way, the children would play level one through to level four in that order. Then on the side, there's also an, a digital intelligence pack, which has visual supports that they can access, say, on a mobile view. They could access their stress ball and do some slow breathing uh, when they're in the supermarket with mum. There's a mission journal where they can do practice tasks and self-reflect and report back. Uh, and there's a scene generator where they can create scenes, um, maybe to explore comic strip conversation type scenarios or just to visually describe something that's happened for them. So that's the what's that's what's inside the computer game pack. And I think I showed on my previous slide, I'll just go back. Yeah, there is a computer game pack guide that's a free download uh, that people can look at and it has how to play all the different games. It also has skill by skill, which activities in the game relate to teaching which skills. So you could literally go, all right, I want to teach anxiety stuff, which is the anxiety levels, look in the book, oh, that's the game I need to play with this child to help me have that conversation. Okay, that's computer game back. So it's just one little piece of what's within that full small group program. Then there's the physical SAS intelligence pack, which is cards and stickers and a co-card holder. Um, this can be used to accompany the small group program or the computer game pack so that the kids have a physical in their pocket, there's a little co-card holder here that fits in a pocket, version of their emotionometers or their relaxation gadgets, et cetera, that they can refer to whenever they like. Um, you can also just buy at any time and use the bits for anything you like, okay? But it's usually along with the computer game pack or the small group program. Wonderful, so that's, that's three things so far. The fourth thing I just wanna mention is the training component. There's two um, formal training courses that most people know about that are associated with the small group program. Facilitator training course, um, details are there, assistant short course, and then sometimes we run computer game workshops. Uh, at the moment, like this year, I know we've got one scheduled at a conference where we're running a computer game workshop as part of the, the delegates of the conference can come along and experience a computer game workshop. The top one is a, is a gateway to delivering a small group program. The computer game workshop, you don't have to do if you have the computer game pack. Um, it's, it's just an optional extra. Now, the system short course. Some people use this for its original purpose is so you can have an assistant helping you with this small group program group when you've got the kiddies or the parents in the room. But because it's only two to three hours, it's, it's quite... Uh, cost effective to enroll in it. Some people use it as a bit of a taste tester to check out the program a bit, see what the platform looks like a little bit. Um, so it, it can be used for different things. Same with the facilitator training course, although it's designed for you to upskill to start delivering the program, lots of people over the years have used it for 14 hours of professional development or to learn about how the full program works and then to use the resources in a different way. Like this, and a few people have talked to me um, over the years um, about their new grads and when they have uh, younger clinicians or teachers that they've found this really helpful to give them guidance and structure to then uh, while getting while being encouraged to individualize it then helps them to really find their feet as a in their own uh, as a clinician in their own own way anyway that's the training bit now how can all these things be used flexibly I indicated before that lots of people have been asking about individual work now, and it totally makes sense that something that's called the SAS small group program, you would could automatically assume it means you need to have a group of kids. It's actually not the case. You can have a group of one. The platform is all set up for that. 
Uh, there's current facilitators that run it with just one child at a time. Uh, there are published research papers on running it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so I know sometimes the question is just, can I do this? Sometimes it's, does it work? Do we know if, you know, is there evidence behind it? Yeah, there already is. Um, in Australia and Canada, actually, that's the research in that area. In the facilitator manual, there's tips and tricks, considerations for individual use. For example, um, when you don't have the group of kids there all the time, uh, there's ways that you can integrate peer-to-peer -peer skill practice that you need to consider. So yes, you can do individual work. Uh, the com computer game pack for individual work, most certainly. Every child can have their own computer game pack, their own login, have their progress tracked, and then they can log in and they can play it uh, with you in a lesson or a session. They can play it at mum's house, dad's house, library, wherever. And it can be done structured one-on-one, -on -one, unstructured, or as I said earlier, just play a particular game in a, in a session while you're talking about bullying, for example. Um, there are also published papers, particularly this remote parent coaching um, model that is using the computer game pack for one child, not having them come together as a group. The remote parent coaching one, though, is a little slightly different in that the trained professional is supporting the parent to deliver the intervention at home, but you're not managing a group at once. It's still individual work, if that makes sense, with parents assisting you. I'll, I'll uh, give you more information on that. Uh, with the intelligence pack, you do you can in, do all of the above what I just said, just they have the physical resources, um, either as part of a structured process or just having bits and bobs that you pass on. So hopefully that helps for those of you who want to know about individual work. Another one that we get asked a lot is what can you do with a mainstream classroom or a whole, a big group? Because SS is a small group. It's meant to be one facilitator with three kids or two with six. But let's say you've got a group of 25. Um, the computer game pack, you can um, put it on the large screen in front of the class and have everyone observe and discuss their answers or take turns in answering the, uh, uh, playing the game. Um, and you can print off blank, blank mission journals and hand them out to the class as well as some examples. So you can use that resource in a whole class setting. The intelligence pack is simply the answer is you would have one for each student in the class. That's easy. Small group programs, a little bit not so easy. It is not designed as a whole class solution. The content and the platform, it really isn't designed for that. Unless you're in a specialist school where you've got like a group of six, class of six, that's where you can use it. Um, the program does encourage skill use at school and in class. And as I mentioned, empowers the teachers and the schools to help support the child to generalise things at school. Um, but it isn't a whole of class program. So if you're after whole of class, it's the computer game pack or the intelligence pack that you're after. Um, or, sorry, my next slide is the other alternative too. Uh, there are free resources on inclusive classroom practices put out by the Autism CRC through a website called Inclusion Ed. That QR code will take you straight to an SAS practice, but then you can go to all the other ones. Um, it's uh, an inclusive classroom practice that has free handouts and all sorts of things, little video explainers and information um, on how to work on or explore detecting body clues that signal you're having an emotion in a classroom setting. Okay, so there's a lovely free resource for those of you from school settings uh, who want to pass on the, the uh, uh, inclusive classroom practices. Fabulous. All right, so we've done individual, and we've done whole of class. Next set of questions had been around remote support and telehealth. Now, the good news is that the small group program is designed for that, as I said, for in-person telehealth or hybrid. The, um, the facilitator training course gives you tips on how to do this. It also has um, uh, footage of telehealth sessions as well as in-person sessions. And there's already published research that's showing you still get uh, the same results when you run the program via telehealth. When it comes to the computer game pack, you can use it that way, but it's not the same as a small group program in that either you or the child are logged into the computer game if you're using it live and you're share screening that experience. You have no direct visibility or direct control over what's happening to change something or help out. Okay. Whereas in the small group program, 
Uh, you can actually see what all three kids in your group are doing. You can write in an answer for them. Uh, they can get your attention by raising their hand. It's like a live platform where you're all logged into the same, same thing. Computer game pack, just one person's logged in and you're screen sharing. Um, but you can still use it. Um, then the intelligence pack use, really, you just have to make sure you've posted them out <laughs> to all the families. Now, this parent coaching model I've been mentioning, um, there's two papers. So it was original pilot to test it out and then a randomized control trial where they were using the computer game pack at home where parents were being coached by a remote professional to deliver a sequence uh, at home to help children with their emotion regulation and different social problem solving things. Um, it's currently just in the research papers. It's not a, uh, a separate manual or package that you can, you can purchase to roll out as a, as a thing but you can still deliver parent-assisted remote coaching SAS services using the resources that we have available, using the published research as a guide, or come and talk to us for tips and tricks on how to do it if you wanted to do this. Um, just remembering that it's the model is using the computer game pack, so it's only those limited skills and activities that are in the four levels of gameplay. It's not the full um, small group program content and process. But yeah, there's a parent coaching model that has published research that you can use anytime that some people online may never have uh, realised. Okay, now talking about that small group program just then is a good segue to look at this. Now, I know that there's current SAS facilitators and people who don't yet run the program who um, see this structure or know what the full program involves and are... Uh, worried about going outside of that, doing things differently than exactly how something might be written. So I want to talk a little bit about that and talk about how we can use these resources flexibly to do a whole number of things, including when you might use these resources to deliver a service that you wouldn't call the small group program, but you'd be using those resources. Hopefully that'll make sense in just a moment. <laughs> um, so the small group program is designed to be individualized. Those of you who have done the facilitator training, you would know that like, I don't know, 50% of the course is all about thinking about different children and their different needs and how you might adapt what you're doing in group to meet that need. Um, you're not doing SA a small group well if you're not individualizing for each child, okay? So it is just, it's expected and it's what works well. Now, because people get um, worried about that or confused about that, we introduced, I think it was last year, was it Melissa? The facilitation flexometer was Melissa's brainchild. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is to help people with considering um, when am I going uh, too far away from what SA small group program is and the evidence base and to be able to say, I know I'm doing what we know is best practice. Um, and how do I manage it when, when someone or myself or someone else is taking it to, following it too closely, so to speak? Um, a really simple example. Sometimes very new clinicians or educators um, want to read out all the example scripts that are in the facilitator manual rather than come up with their own words and do it in their own way. Sometimes that's following too close sometimes because you're not actually reading the room and, and adapting it for that group. So we've got this facilitation flexometer. Um, and oh, got my little animation that I forgot was there. Here we go. Um, what it's saying is when you're running SA small group program, your best practice delivery is when you have all the core components and you're adapting them to meet the needs. Drifting too far is where you remove large chunks of the core, core, core components and drifting, sorry, following too close might be what I just said, reading all the scripts instead of making it individualized, or you might do all the high level content that's there as an optional as optional content for kids that it's not suitable for, that could be following it too close, um, or where you're not customising their skill tracker targets. Those of you who are trained know what I'm talking about, and those of you who are new to it, I realise this might be a bit of a mystery, um, where you're just doing standard what's in the book and not individualising it. So there's this whole range, and we've got these few examples to, to help you use your facilitation flexometer to get that sweet spot in the middle. What I'm also going to share is how you could purposefully drift too far, use the resources for something different, but make sure you're not claiming to families that you're offering them the evidence-based group program when you do so. 
think that's you know our professional responsibility here um, to to be thinking about that. Okay, so running the small group program yet adapting the core components. Some examples. You are expected to integrate whatever themes work for those kids, whatever their particular interests are, what current popular culture is, is going on. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're behind the times with updating a particular thing that's not cool anymore that's mentioned in the program. You need to make it currently cool if we haven't been able to update that image or that word. Um, or there might have been an event that happened in the child's life that day at school, and so you you use that to work around uh, in your session. That's part of running the small group program. You could adapt the missions or add new missions around what your what the needs are of the children or what's happening. Um, so, for example, some services have parallel. Uh, social groups or skills practice groups where it's like Minecraft groups, Lego groups, art groups, and their SAS cadets are got doing that as well where they're practicing their skills while they're playing uh, Minecraft or doing art. So you might adapt a mission or their skill tracker targets to something to do with what you're doing in that group as an example. Again, that's still within running a small group program. Same with the neurodivergent affirming um, social groups or diagnosis exploration groups where it's more about um, feeling, uh, demasking, exploring what my profile means, et cetera. SAS small group doesn't cover anyone having any diagnosis whatsoever. It's just about building skills on emotions and, and understanding others and sharing my, uh, my own needs, problem solving, et cetera. So um, again, you could be doing that parallel before or afterwards and create new missions that are related to that. Um, you know, notice what I pick up what I notice when I'm in that uh, neurodivergent affirming social group and how I'm feeling when I'm at school in my reading class. <laughs> and let's look at that as part of my mission self-reflection. What am I noticing about my body? Um, what could I ask my teacher for help with, for example? I just made that up, but, you know, I'm talking about creating new missions, tailoring to what's going on for your group. Cool. So that's examples of adapting um, the core components. The extension topics I mentioned before, there's the top 10 negotiation tactics. There's how to um, deal with recovering from play situations that aren't going so well. Uh, there's how to maintain two-way conversations that are more complex if you're wanting to have a two-way conversation uh, and feelings alerts. These are purposefully added to the program. They were added in the second edition of SAS because clinicians asked for it. They said, I keep having to add this content and it's like I need to do this extra work to go and find it and create it and deliver it to the kids. And so it got integrated into the second edition of SAS. But it's optional content because often when you've got a group of eight to nine-year-olds, they're not at a level to be doing the conversation equations or the top 10 negotiation tactics. It all depends on your group. So you need to choose when to show them or not, and you can show them at any time during the program you like. There are an additional um, add-in option. So you could cover them at a different time than materials suggest. You could cover them not at all. You could repeat them, repeat them two modules on. So again, all that kind of flexibility is built in. This one's a common uh, one I hear. For example, uh, the parents I work with don't want to come to the groups, therefore I can't run it. They don't want to commit to the full structure, so I can't run SAS. It's not true. You can run SAS small group we're talking about. You can run SAS small group where there's a family who can't participate. You can run an entire group where the parents can't participate. You just have to do use the combine your clinical skills, best available evidence, that family's needs to come up with something flexible and creative that does the best job to empower that family and that child with wraparound supports. So it might be releasing, let's say parents uh, can't or won't or something, come to parent group meetings. You can still schedule them, complete and release those notes so that in their mentor portal, they can read all the content about what happened that week. Like you still allow them to have access to that content. You might choose to tick the teacher tip sheet role instead so they're getting the summary version that the teachers get because that might be easier. And by the way, on our wish list in the future, we're going to develop easy read parent tip sheets um, for a more diverse range of parents, which will then allow us to have more language um, 
translated versions as well. That's down the track, but it's on the list. Um, you can also add as many mentors as you like to a particular child and have them do the roles that perhaps traditionally a parent would do. Maybe the um, head of learning support at school will do the assessment measures and, and do the skill tracker check-in or help them with their missions and gameplay, that kind of thing. Um, so your job is to try and empower the child and the family as much as you can, but you still just adapt to what, what life has brought, basically. All right. Now, a piece of SAS that people have asked about, because there's lots of published research on something called Operation Regulation, SAS Operation Regulation, which is a program that only focuses on the emotion recognition and regulation. So it's more child mental health rather than the full suite of emotion and social skills. So I want to talk about this element of the resources for a bit. So in SAS Small Group Program and in the Computer Game Pack and the ETEL Pack, the first step is recognising uh, other people's clues. Oh, sorry, your own, sorry, talking about emotion recognition regulation in yourself. Recognising your own body clues that tell you you're experiencing different emotions. Then you start to look at degrees. How do you know when it's shifting, when it's coming on small, when it's getting too big, when it's too rapid, all that kind of stuff. It's designed to build hierarchically from those two steps with um, in the small group program, there's whole that you teach it in session. No, sorry, they learn it in the computer game. You explore it in session and practice it in session. Then they go off and do practice missions and have their skill tracker and other people are supporting them. And then you, you keep evolving that and talking about it in session. And then once you've got that um, emotion recognition of body clues and the degrees, you start to learn about relaxation gadgets which is strategies you could use to help you to feel calmer and braver when, when that's what you need to do or want to do. So things like slow breathing, mindfulness, sensory toys, cognitive strategies, physical energy release, you tailor those gadgets to the needs of the kids you're working with. Just because SAS has, I don't, I don't know, there's probably about 20 different relaxation gadgets to choose from. There's also custom cards where you can make up a completely different one. So whatever is actually appropriate for that child. And then it gets applied to complex social contexts. How that happens in the computer game pack versus a small group program is very different. Um, the, which I think I have on the next slide here. Whoops, too far. So small group program, it's the recognition and regulation piece is early on in the, in the modules. And then you keep repeating it and practicing it as you're learning all the more complex social situations. It's a real sort of hierarchy and repeat process. So that the kids at the end, they're more, much more equipped to actually regulate in complex situations. With um, the computer game pack, it teaches the core concepts, exposes them to start to self-reflect on their own body clues, and it shows them scenarios where what happens if you choose to use or not use your gadgets uh, in particular situations. But if, if you, uh, it doesn't... Um, go and it further explain it and answer its questions about that. It doesn't do a role play with them to apply it to the scenario that just happened with their little brother. That's what the professionals need to do. We need to further explore the content, have practice activities, put in adult supports uh, so that the parents and teachers know how to do incidental teaching with it to really get the full effect. So that's the difference. Computer Game Pack is a tool you can use to teach and then you do your other professional work around it. Small group program, it's already all pre-prepared and it's got a nice structured process where everyone's got their resources and connected through the digital platform. So having said that, how would you run SAS operation regulation that you can see in the published papers when it's not that is, uh, you can go to our web shop and, and buy that one, so to speak, because <clears throat> it's, it's not a thing. It's, a, it's a, something for, that was for research. What you do is you use the small group program platform to deliver operation regulation or you use a small group program platform to deliver whatever version of it you want to make from that set of resources. This is where I think um, it'd be really helpful for the current facilitators who are, who are thinking they have to do everything in that order. So the example here. You might just run modules one to three. Those of you who are familiar with it, that's 
bionic powers, emotion recognition, emotion regulation, essentially. You could do it in split modules and spread it out, have extra emphasis on the emotions bit. You could just do three, then do something else. You could repeat them. Um, you could pair it with module four because you want to do the friendship formula and uh, friend profiling, et cetera, as well. You could keep doing just bits of the rest of the modules. You could completely reorder the program by all it determines, and I've written it on my slide here, I think. Um, edit the date and time of the meetings to your desired schedule. Okay, so maybe you want to do one, two, and three to do emotion recognition and emotion regulation. And then you want to jump to decoder for the social problem solving formula. So you would schedule modules one, two, and three in order. Then you'd have to schedule module four. But when you schedule module five, you put it in the date and time before module four and delete module four. So all you're doing is module one, two, three, and five, and that's how you've used the resources. Hopefully this is making sense for current trained facilitators. Um, when you schedule, it unlocks the next one for you to schedule. So you can schedule the whole lot and then you could rearrange the order of them through their date and time. When you complete and finalize a meeting, that's when it releases the notes to the kids and to the parents, depending on what meeting you're running. So you determine what they get uh, at the end. So if you've opened up module five, which uh, for those who don't know, module five has essentially the conversation code and the decoder problem solving formula. If you're only wanting to do problem solving formula, you'd hide all of the conversation code slides and the other slides, only have the decoder slides, run that meeting however you're going to run it. When you hit complete and when you hit finalize, only the decoder formula information is going to be released to the parents or the kids. Okay. Um, so you can determine the order of the information and which information you use the platform for. So if you wanted to focus only on emotion regulation, I've got the tips, tips there. What you would need to be careful of is not saying you're running or offering to this family the full small group program. And I've got on the next slide here so an example of what you might say instead. You might say you're utilising the SAS small group platform to deliver an emotion-focused therapy package. Okay. All right. Now, that might have triggered some questions and things, so we'll look forward to those coming through either on the chat or uh, later on after the, the session. Um, but yeah, so you could run an, an emotional teaching experience using the small group program platform, which is usually for a full comprehensive uh, program that covers emotions, problem solving, friendship, and a whole heap of social skills. All right, let's keep moving on. The next thing that we hear, um, a lot of questions about from both parents and facilitators um, is around neurodivergent affirming approaches. Um, so I want to uh, share some information and hopefully clarify some things. I've also got on this slide a QR code here because we have a web page dedicated to this topic and there's a recorded um, webinar that I think is about an hour um, exploring in depth that particular topic, so valuing neurodiversity with SAS. Now, for some people online, this isn't relevant to your work or the children that you work with with SAS. For some people online today, it will be. So I think it's worth sharing. SAS is offered for children who are neurodivergent and although the, also those who are not. There is truly a neurodiverse range of children who access SAS and the facilitator team are who deliver and determine the approach that they're using when they're delivering it. And as I said earlier, there's no diagnosis labeling happening in the normal SAS program. Um, there's no, hi, you've got this diagnosis, you've got this, this is what your profile means. It's just generic in terms of people's strengths, weaknesses, uh, we're learning skills. It is designed to be a suite of social and emotional skills teaching tools, okay? So some providers deliver SAS using a neurodivergent affirming approach and some don't. Um, and I've already mentioned the whole point is that it's individualized to meet the needs of each uh, family. Now, when parents are reaching out to us, 
Sometimes they're specifically looking for services that are after uh, that. Sorry, not after. They're looking for services that are delivering neurodivergent affirming approaches. So on our find a provider map, parents can actually tick a box here that says, yes, that's what I'm looking for. And it will filter out the providers that haven't indicated that on their search um, settings. Uh, so if there's any providers online or SS facilitators online and you do offer neurodivergent affirming practices, you just need your provider admin to go into your map settings and make sure the, the tick is the box is checked at your end um, so that it displays when parents use that. Now, the other thing linked to this that I've, I've got for you is common questions that parents may be asking their SAS services when they're contacting them about SAS. And there's three there I've bolded because I think they're relevant to this conversation. Some of them are asking, are you going to individualize this for my child's goals and needs? Or they might come to you with a particular uh, philosophy or value or cultural background and say, can you individualize the way you do this for me? Um, same thing with neurodivergence. So some of them are asking, are you a neurodivergent affirming service? Some of them, it's not on their radar to ask that. Some of them particularly are asking, do any of your team openly identify with lived experience of neurodivergence or are any of your team autistic? Might be more specific. Um, so some families are looking for um, autistic-led SAS small group program or other SAS resource use. Some families are not. Um, so those of you who are thinking about the way you advertise your service, sometimes highlighting these on your websites can help as well so that people know whether they can come and ask these questions or, not, or they don't need to. That's parents asking questions. Then us as professionals need to ask questions <laughs> to help with the neurodivergent affirming approaches that you might be using. Um, this I've just this is just one uh, resource I like to plug. It's from Griffith University in Australia. The QR code should go to this resource. If it doesn't anymore, please let me know and I'll update it. It should go to this therapy uh, this resource, which is uh, some sheets that prompt you as a clinician of what things to check and ask with the family so that you can make, for example, your clinic environment more um, suitable for this particular family or the way you ask questions or work or the way your room is set up. Um, all sorts of different things there, but I thought I'd give you that, uh, that as a little extra resource. So you've got a few QR codes collecting along this webinar. Hopefully one of them is relevant to your needs. Now, getting into the content and different um, ways that people use a neurodivergent affirming approach with SAS resources. Um, so in the program, uh, in module five, there's something called the conversation code, where kids start to explore and brainstorm different ways that people talk to each other. You explore a, a framework for thinking about how to have a two-way conversation with someone. Again, that's not always the conversation that we're wanting to have, but when we do, when we wanna have a two-way conversation, this can help them guide them through that. Then in the facilitator training notes, there's tips on how to take that further, on how to have the kids, um, not only how to make a different version of that code for a different type of conversation, or to make it a simpler code because you've got a child who needs less steps and less, less words, for example. Um, you also have tips on trying to make a talking with me code where it might be how I love to have conversations, which may not be that two-way conversation that you gave them guidance on as well. So they've got multiple things. Um, I love hearing about the, the talking with me code where everyone in the group's made one and they're exploring the similarities and differences about how I like to talk and how this person likes to talk and how this person likes to talk. Oh, look, it's actually all different. Um, and then they've got that to empower them to have the conversation with others in their life about how they feel comfortable talking while they're also learning how to talk with people who may have a different way of having a conversation to them. So the way you go about that, the depth you go into with it, it's totally up to you as a professional to use your skills, the evidence base, the, the child's needs and profile to be flexible and creative. You could even add a whole extra session. You run the, the, the um, how to have a two-way guide and then get them to practice that and then have another session on what did you notice when you tried and how do you like to do it differently? You could put in a whole nother session and use the customizable activity slides to, um, to get them to talk about different things with you. Sorry, I'm going into detail with this one <laughs> and running out of time. The computer game pack 
Um, it doesn't have those tips and that guidance and that process, but it does have the customizable card. So you can make a whole new talking with me card, for example, code, or you can make an adapted conversation code. It comes with the pre-made conversation code and it comes with customizable ones. Um, same with the intelligence pack. There's no tips and guidance and structure around it, but it does have blank code cards with the same framework in the artwork and then you draw or write in the, the code card that you want to create. All right, to uh, take us on the home stretch, the next area that people have been asking about in terms of that, that helps with knowing um, the evidence base behind the flexibility is where has it been? Like which children has it been evaluated with and in what settings? Um, and I, I've got this here just because I really like this photo. <laughs> this is from... Um, Last year, the International Meeting for Aut International Society uh, for Autism Researchers meeting in Stockholm, and we had this photo is people from three different parts of the world: Ireland, Australia, and Canada. Um, and it was a really cool event where there was about six research posters on SAS from different people researching on different angles um, and from different types of services and countries. It was uh, Melissa. You can see Melissa and I were there. It was it was really cool. Um, anyway, so point is. This started back in 2002 as a PhD project and we have multiple people interested in researching it and coming together and sharing that research still today uh, and the evidence is just growing. The QR code there takes you to our web page on the evidence, has all publications for the people who really want to go to the journals. It's got all the references to publications as well as a, a narrative on it. So in summary here, um, it's there's evidence or research studies that have used SAS, various components of SAS, like I talked about, um, with kids that are diagnosed with either a form of neurodivergence or a mental health disorder. Um, so, for example, there's definitely studies on autism, ADHD, anxiety, co-occurring speech and language challenges, and mild to moderate intellectual uh, disabilities. Excuse me. Also, though, there's published work on undiagnosed children who just had social emotional needs of some sort you don't have to have a diagnosis it's up to you guys to screen suitability uh, and your own service eligibility for when you use the program it's been uh, evaluated in clinics and community um, with psychologists and speeches it's got both telehealth and in-person publications um, this one i think is important to point out the studies so far that have compared genders it's only been boys and girls there hasn't been other gender about in the research to date. So just um, sometimes people ask about that. It's just that's where the researchers have collected information on gender so far. Um, there's studies on group, individual and parent assisted. The age range is important. There are published papers uh, spanning kids who are seven to 14, but the statistics, is, uh, the numbers are there for the statistics to be meaningful for eight to 12 year olds. So you'll always hear us say it's evidence-based for eight to 12 year olds. However, that doesn't mean that you don't use your clinical judgment to run it with a 13 or a 14 or a 15 year old who has the skill needs that fit the program and you have the skill to adapt it to their needs, for example. Um, there's studies with bilingual facilitators, there's families with a range of disadvantage factors, and there's school-based trials, both in specialist autism classes and in a mainstream school setting. Um, now that's, probably not an exhaustive list, but it, I picked it because it covered a lot of the questions people asked about that stuff. Again, QR code will take you to more detail. All right, and now I've only got my summary slides. So we've done well with timing and I'm looking forward to the questions coming, coming through and when we turn the recording off. <laughs> so just to summarise, us, at our, our team at SST, we provide you with SAS resources and training to set you up to teach a suite of social emotional skills to children. Whether that's the full suite or whether it's one skill, that's up to what you're doing uh, in your practice. There's structured and unstructured options. There's comprehensive skill packages, and then you could just go specific targets. Uh, there's professional training and the evidence base is already done for you um, to come along and, and train and then, and then use your skill to, to move it forward. Uh, SAS providers deliver SAS using neurodivergent affirming practices and some do not. It is more about a service choice and values uh, than about the program content itself. 
uh, and we're doing our best to um, update the content so that it allows for people delivering it with different kids in different settings with different approaches as best we can. Um, and we love getting feedback that helps us identify where we've missed something or where there's a, a bit that we can uh, further improve when possible. Uh, SAS is designed to be individualised to meet the needs and values of each family service. It is not designed to be out of the box cookie cutter. It's designed to be real clinicians using their skill to individualise. Remembering all brains and services are unique, so you need to be doing it differently. Every group should be different in every service. So combine your skills with the best available evidence, uh, the child and the family's goals and values, uh, and have fun working flexibly and creatively uh, to do that, uh, to meet the child's needs. And thank you very much, everyone. There's that QR code for the contact us form to ask more questions. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful sharing this information with you. And we are going to stop the recording now so that the people online uh, can ask questions if they like. Thank you.